Hi everyone, Dr. Hinky here with today's um, video lecture on Chapter 10, Meiosis and Sexual Reproduction. Um, one thing I recommend is reviewing mitosis, making sure you're really solid on the steps of mitosis and what mitosis is used for. That is how we go from being a single celled organism after fertilization to being a multicellular organism with about 35 trillion cells uh, at maturity. Mitosis increases the number of cells so that we can increase in size or so that single-celled organisms can increase their population size and it's how we replace older damaged cells so we repair tissue through mitosis meiosis is another way that cells divide uh, goes through some similar processes but really really different outcomes and purposes uh, so this lecture will go over, do an overview of meiosis, talk about genetic variation introduced into populations because of meiosis, look at the phases of meiosis, then we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison of meiosis and mitosis, we'll look at the, the cycle of life, uh, and we'll talk about what happens if we have some mistakes or errors during meiosis. So meiosis um, is really, really important for life. Um, populations are healthier and more stable if there is diversity within them, variation within the population. If we were all identical clones, then any change in the environment that was adverse would kill every member of the population. Variation allows some members to be more fit for differences in environments. So in one environment, one variation will be more fit. In another, uh, a different variation will be more fit. This is what natural selection acts on, is variation in a population. So all living things have ways to introduce diversity, even those organisms that reproduce by binary fission, bacteria, resulting in clones. Uh, they get variation through random mutation, and they've developed strategies to share different genes to sort of mix things up in there. Any of you who take microbiology will learn more about that. It's pretty fascinating. Um, but diversity is really important. There are more than 70 trillion different genetic combinations possible from the mating of two human individuals. We'll look at how that number works out. Uh, and males and females differ in the way they form gametes, and that is what meiosis does. It forms gametes. Um, and we will look at gametogenesis, the formation of gametes specific. Meiosis gives us uh, the basic cell structure for that, but then we go through some differentiation. In males, meiosis begins, uh, or sperm production begins at puberty. In females, meiosis actually starts before birth and continues until uh, menopause. So quick review of our cell cycle. This is our normal cell cycle, how we increase the number of cells in our body. We start with a single cell that goes through G1. Through its growth phase, it accumulates raw materials, it gets larger in size, it doubles the organelles, and it does its normal metabolic roles. That means it does its job, whatever type of cell it is. If it's a muscle cell, it contracts and relaxes. If it's a nerve cell, it transmits nerve impulses. Whatever its role is, this is what it's doing, uh, G1. Then it, then it proceeds into the next step at a certain size when it gets certain signals from its neighboring cells, uh, when it's damaged that, hey, we need to divide now. And it enters the S phase where the DNA is replicated. This is like going to the copy machine uh, with your one page of homework so that you can pass on a copy to your friend. You don't now have two pages worth of homework to do. You have a copy of the same page of homework. So it's still one single page of homework. So here we came in with two N chromosomes, 46 in humans. Here we have two N, 46 duplicated chromosomes. 
We call those duplicates the Xerox copy sister chromatids. So we still have 46 or 2N, but now they are duplicated. Then we go into our G2 phase. The growth here is uh, gathering what we need and preparing, building the proteins that we need to go through mitosis. We go through mitosis, a series of orderly steps to divide the nucleus and the nuclear contents, the chromosomes. We go through prophase, chromosomes condense, nuclear envelope disappears, centrosomes move to opposite poles of the cell, uh, spindle fiber forms, and then metaphase, those spindle fibers are attached to each of the sister chromatids at the kinetochore. Uh, and lined up along the metaphase plate down the center line of the cell. Anaphase, those spindles pull apart toward opposite poles and they separate the sister chromatids. In telophase, those sisters are now divided. We have 46 or 2N at one pole, 46 or 2N at the other pole. Uh, they are single, unduplicated chromosomes. The nuclear envelope reforms around each of those uh, groups. The plasma membrane starts to pinch in, forming the cleavage furrow, and those the cytoskeleton, push, cytoskeleton pushes the um, cytoplasm apart. And then we go through cytokinesis, where that process continues until we have two separate cells. So. At the end of telophase, we have two nuclei in a single cell, and then cytokinesis divides that cytoplasm equally around those. And now we have two cells that will go through that same process. So that's going on in humans from the time of birth until the time we're adults. This is where meiosis comes in. So as adults, as functioning um, beings, we have to have 2N, the complete number of chromosomes. So mom has 2N, 46 chromosomes. Dad has 2N, 46 chromosomes. They got those 46 chromosomes in every single one of their cells in their body because every one of those cells comes from mitosis, making an exact, exact copy of the original fertilized cell they started with. Dad, in uh, his germ tissue, the testes, also undergoes a process called meiosis to produce the sperm, which results in a cell with half the number of chromosomes, or N, 23 chromosomes in the sperm. Mom undergoes meiosis in her germ cells in the ovaries to produce eggs that are also haploid or N, they have half the number of chromosomes. So meiosis is sometimes called reduction division. We divide the cell and we divide the number of chromosomes in half. The egg and the sperm come together at fertilization to form a zygote that is back to 2N, the single cell that we all start with, 2N, our diploid number, the correct number of chromosomes. So now I can undergo mitosis to grow, to increase in size, and to become a full adult with 35 trillion cells through mitosis. So the only time we use meiosis is to produce eggs and sperm. The only tissue in our body that undergoes meiosis are the germ tissues, ovaries or testes. Those also, every cell in our body undergoes mitosis, so in order to become mature ovaries and testes, the germ tissue undergoes mitosis till it reaches its full size. And then that tissue, cells in that tissue undergo meiosis. Those are the only cells in the body that undergo meiosis, but they also undergo mitosis. So let's go through a little bit more detail on meiosis. It's a special type of cell division. It is not sexual reproduction, but it's used to prepare for sexual reproduction. In order to have sexual reproduction, we need um, male and female gametes. We need cells with half the number of chromosomes from two different individuals to come together to join to make a, parent, a, a diploid individual. 
in this process, we are in the cell cycle, the normal cell cycle. The germ cells are going in the G1 phase. Um, and then they enter the S phase and they make a duplicate copy, a sister chromatid um, of each one of the 46 chromosomes because these are diploid cells, right? The germ cells, the ovaries and testes are, that tissue is diploid. So we start with diploid cells. We duplicate, we have diploid cells with sister chromatids, with duplicated chromosomes, 2N, but each one of these 46 in humans has its identical sister chromatid, its Xerox copy attached. And through meiosis, we end up with four daughter cells. Do you remember mitosis, we ended up with two daughter cells, each with the same number of chromosomes, 2N. Here we're gonna have four daughter cells, each with half the number of chromosomes N in our gametes. So our haploid cells contain a single set of chromosomes. Let's remember we are 2N, two sets. One set we get from mom, one set from dad, 2N. N is just one of those sets. If there were no reduction of chromosomes, if we didn't have the number of chromosomes to N during meiosis, then in each generation at fertilization, when the egg and the sperm joined, we would double the number of chromosomes. And as we'll see, having an incorrect chromosome number for even one chromosome leads to drastic impacts, adverse impacts. Uh, so this would definitely not be good. So our gametes are N haploid gametes, fuse, the egg and the sperm fuse during fertilization, and we end up with a 2N zygote. The zygote, becomes the next generation by undergoing mitosis. So if anything goes wrong during meiosis, we'll look at some of these errors. The gametes can contain the wrong number of chromosomes uh, that can lead to a lot of uh, adverse impacts on the individual. Right. So within the germ tissue, as we're developing, as we're growing through embryonic development, fetal development into uh, infancy, childhood, up to puberty, our germ cells are going through this process to grow and increase in number as we increase in number and size. And then at maturity, or for females during fetal development, uh, we start to go from, whoop, Oops, sorry. Through this process at maturity, now these cells are going to undergo meiosis. So they will still go through the S phase. They'll come through here. This arrow is kind of in the wrong place. They'll come through. Uh, they'll do their normal job. They'll do their normal growth. Their S phase, the number of chromosomes are going to rep. Uh, be replicated. So we have 2N duplicate chromosomes, 2N46, each with a sister chromatid. Then we re prepare, but now we're going to prepare, prepare for meiosis. And instead of going through mitosis, we're going to jump over here and we're going to go through this process. All right. So from, from interphase, here's my S phase on interphase. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go through similar steps, prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one. And then we're going to have a little timeout here called interkinesis because we need to rest and get more energy and um, accumulate some more raw material to go through this process. A second time, we don't go through the S phase again, right? This is one continuous process. It's not a cycle. The end product isn't going to go through this again. Right? So here we go through prophase one, metaphase one, our first round, meiosis one. And then we go through those steps again, prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two. So this is meiosis two. We go through th two rounds of nuclear division. Meiosis one divides the nucleus from the original cell 
into two daughter nuclei and two daughter cells. And then meiosis two, each of those nuclei is then divided into two and we end up, and those cells divided into two, so we end up with four daughter cells that are haploid. They have half the number of chromosomes from what we started with. In this example, we see we started with one, two, three, four chromosomes. We went through meiosis one, through meiosis two, and our daughter cells now have two. These cells, it's not cyclical, these cells don't then undergo meiosis. These cells now are going to either become eggs or sperm and go on to be used for sexual reproduction or lost. Um, so it's not cyclical, but to get there, the cells undergo the same cycle of mitosis, the cell cycle, but at maturity, um, at their maturity to produce gametes, we jump into meiosis. So first with meiosis, oop, that says mitosis, that should say meiosis. Hmm. Fix that. Um, all right, so uh, with meiosis, uh, we have homologous pairs of chromosomes. So this is in all of our cells. This is our 2N number. So body cells are the somatic cells. In every cell in our body, chromosomes occur in pairs. And we've talked about this extensively. We get one pair from mom, N chromosomes, the haploid number, and we get N chromosomes, the haploid number from dad. So haploid is N, di, that prefix indicates two. The diploid number, 2N, is the total number in a complete individual. We need to have all 46 chromosomes in humans uh, to become a functioning individual. So eggs and sperm, that N haploid number, can't develop into an individual. We don't have all the information we need. The chromosomes that we get from mom and dad are not random. They are a specific set of chromosomes, uh, 23 different sets or 23 pairs. So for every one chromosome, we have chromosomes from numbers one through 23. For every number one through 23 from mom, we have a homologue that means similar, a similar chromosome, number one through 23 from dad. Homologous chromosomes have the same length. Their centromeres, the place where they uh, attach to their sister during the S phase, are in the same place. So on chromosome one from mom, that centromere is in the same place as on chromosome one from dad. So in a slightly different place on chromosome two, but chromosome two from mom's centromere is on the same location as that of the centromere on chromosome two from dad. So we get one from the father, one from the mother, the paternal hom homolog and the maternal homolog. And the way they're stained, when we stain them to look at them, um, we do this for genetic counseling um, to examine the chromosomes they show similar banding patterns. So similar genes along the chromosome, length of the chromosome stain similarly. So this is what that looks, looks like. Uh, each of these, these are kind of side by side. This is a duplicated chromosome one from mom. This is a duplicated chromosome one from dad. Same length, same banding pattern. This is the centromere where the sister chromatids are attached at the same location on each of these. We order them and number them according to their length. So that's when you go for genetic counseling and they look at these and stain them. Uh, they find the longest, next longest, one, two, three, 22 pairs. 22 is the shortest. It, these are considered um, my autosomes, my body chromosomes. This last pair, 23, here we see they're labeled X instead of 23. These are considered the sex chromosomes. They determine male or female. And this is the only one that's not numbered uh, sequentially as 23 because these are slightly different. Here I have two similar homologous chromosomes. So I have two X's. 
if I get an X from dad and an X from mom, that makes me female. I could get a different, the only non-homologous pair in our 23 chromosomes is number 23 in males. The Y chromosome from dad is a short little chromosome. It is not the exact same length as the X chromosome. Only males get a Y chromosome, so you only get Y chromosomes from your father. Um, and that would be, as a male, this these would not be similar in length. You would have an X and a Y chromosome. So um, the sex chromosomes or chromosome number 23 is the only pair that are not homologous, are not always homologous. So what we're seeing here is a single chromosome that has been duplicated. So sister chromatids. And we have one from, oops, one from our mother and one from our father, one from mom, one from dad. So this would be um, a complete set of chromosomes. We call this a karyotype, this picture. Um, with this is a complete karyotype of a human female. All right, so that shows what the homologous pairs are. One through 23 for a total, if we counted this, one through 23, each one with two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 46 chromosomes. All right, so our homologous chromosomes have genes controlling the same trait at the same position. So when we talk about a gene, genes have information for a specific trait. For example, the trait hairline. Each gene occurs in, a du in duplicate in an individual, right? This is before the S, before we've duplicated our chromosomes, because we have a gene for a hairline. Let's say our hairline gene is here. We have one from mom and one from dad. When we duplicate it, we still have that exact same information on our hairline on this duplicate. So one gene from mom, one gene from dad. Here we've just duplicated it. We get a copy from mom, a copy from dad. That gene, the information that we have, might be in variant form. So we can have information on the same trait, but it might be different information. So hairline, I might have, so the gene for hairline from mom is here. The gene for hairline from dad is here. Same gene, same location. So here and here. But I might have different information on that trait. Here it might tell me I have a straight hairline. Here it tells me I have a widow's peak. So same trait, but different variations, different ways that trait can look. Those variant forms are called alleles. So an allele is an alternative form of the same gene. So the gene codes for a trait. The allele codes for different ways that same trait might look. So an individual can have identical alleles for a specific gene on both of the homologs. So mom and dad might have both given me the allele for a straight hairline, or mom and dad might have both given me the allele for a widow's peak. Or, I could have two different alleles. I might get, as I initially said, straight from dad, widow's peak from mom, or vice versa. So I could have different alleles. That's called heterozygote. Hetero is different in the zygote. Different chromosomes. Homozygote's the same. The same alleles. Here I have one of each allele. An example is a gene coding for short fingers on one homolog for long fingers on the other. So finger length is the trait, the information, or the allele, short versus long. So we refer to meiosis as reduction division. There are two rounds of nuclear division. In meiosis one, the chromosomes are replicated prior to meiosis one, just like in the regular cell cycle. I have sister chromatids, so I have two N chromosomes, but each one of those has a copy. 
So here, chromosome one with its duplicate, its sister chromatid attached, chromosome one from mom with its duplicate sister chromatid attached. Those homologous chromosomes pair up during synapsis. Synapsis occurs early in prophase. The homologous pairs come close together. They kind of wind around each other and the homologs might recombine or swap little pieces of genetic material. So little pieces might trade places. So the, a portion of the chromosome that I got from mom might trade places with that same portion that I got from dad. That's called crossing over. In metaphase, metaphase one, meiosis one, my first round of division, instead of having all 46 chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate and each one of those 46 separated from its sister, as we had in mitosis, instead the homologous pairs line up side by side. So rather than 46 duplicated chromosomes lined up down the middle of the cell, I'm going to have chromosome one side by side with chromosome one, chromosome two side by side with its homolog two, three side by side. So I'll have 23 pairs lined up on the metaphase plate. And then in anaphase one, those homologous pairs separate. So each of the daughter cells at the end of meiosis one only has one of each chromosome from numbers one through 23. So they are no longer paired, they're unpaired, but they're still duplicated. They are still attached to their sister chromatid. But I've reduced my number of chromosomes from 2n, one of each one from mom and one of each one from dad, to n. I only have one of each of those 23 chromosomes. Still duplicated though. Meiosis two, I don't go through that S phase prior. All I have in between these two is this brief timeout called interkinesis, uh, where I generate some more ATP. I gather more materials to divide again. So the DNA isn't replicated. I start with two haploid cells. Each of those haploid cells, the chromat chromatids are duplicated, our sister chromatids. Right, so the Xerox copies. The sister chromatids separate, move to opposite poles. This is exactly like mitosis. In mitosis, I come in with duplicated chromosomes. Every one of those lines up on the metaphase plate and every one of those sister chromatids are pulled apart so that I have single unduplicated chromosomes um, at the opposite ends of the pole that go into two daughter cells at the end. So both of my cells from meiosis one are haploid, but with duplicated chromosomes. In meiosis two, every one of those 23 duplicated chromosomes lines up in metaphase plate, and all of the sister chromatids are separated into daughter um, nuclei first and then daughter cells. So at the end, I have haploid cells, so N chromosomes in humans, that would be 23 and they are unduplicated because I pulled my sister chromatids apart. Right, so single chromatid in each of the daughter cells, only 23. One of each one, numbers one through 23. So if we go through the process, we start with 2n. In this cell, we're starting with 2n equals four. Remember, 2n is a universal number. I can use that for any organism. Uh, whether my number of chromosomes that I'm starting with is 4, 46, 92, whatever it is, 18, depending on what organism I am, 2n. I'm going to divide these. In this specific cell, I have 2n equals 4, 4 chromosomes. The homologous pairs are these that are similar in length, one from dad, one from mom. One of these shorter ones from mom, one of the shorter ones from dad. So these are the homologs. These are unduplicated. So I'm in the G1 phase here. In the S phase of the cell cycle, I replicate my DNA. I still have 2N 
equal four, one, two, three, four chromosomes, but now they are duplicated. They're each attached to their Xerox copy, the sister chromatid. I have a longer chromosome one from dad, a longer chromosome from one from mom duplicated, and a chromosome two from dad and from mom duplicated, attached to the sister chromatid. Okay. So that's after the S phase. I go into G2 to prepare for meiosis now because this is happening in either the ovaries or the testes. At synapse, these two homologs come close to each other. These two homologs come close to each other. And non-sister chromatids, meaning the one from this chromosome one and the one from this chromosome one, can swap pieces. I wouldn't swap pieces with the sister because it's just swapping the exact same information, right? I wouldn't change anything. So even if it did happen, we wouldn't notice. It's when the non-sisters switch that I notice. That's called crossing over. Uh, in this example, I'm not showing crossing over, but that's that would happen during synapse. Here they just come close to each other. Um, they move next to each other. Then they, in metaphase one, line up side by side on the metaphase plate. And then in meiosis one, those homologs are separated. So here is my metaphase plate right down the middle of the homologs. Chromosome one from dad came over into this daughter cell. The way they were lined up ended up with chromosome two from mom in this cell. This daughter cell has duplicated chromosome one from mom and duplicated chromosome two from dad. Now, these only have two chromosomes. They've got Xerox copies of those, but remember it's a Xerox copy, we don't count it. So these are now N equals two. They are haploid cells. Then meiosis 2, so meiosis 1 separates my homologous pairs. I no longer have pairs, so think about a pair of shoes. If I separate it, I'd only have one of each shoe instead of a pair of shoes. So I cut my number in half. Meiosis 2, I separate my sisters. And my sister chromatids separate out. So I have two unduplicated chromosomes, two unduplicated chromosomes, two Two. Each one of these has a different set of combinations of chromosomes from the original parent cell. I have a mom and a dad, a mom and a dad, a dad and a mom, a dad and a mom. Um, so this is already leading to different traits, um, the potential for different traits after fertilization. All right, so how does this lead to genetic variation? So our genetic variation, this is essential. We have to have variation in a population in order to adapt to changes in the environment. And the environment always changes. Um, in order to adapt to that, I have to have uh, variation in my population with some variants better able to survive than others. And that's the basis of evolution of natural selection is variation in a population. Asexually reproducing organisms don't have meiosis to contribute to changing up their genes, so they rely on mutations and some other ways to swap genes. Meiosis, though, brings about lots and lots and lots of genetic variation, and it does this in two ways. Uh, one is through that crossing over, so I'll get new combinations of genes that I've never seen before. Uh, when I switch chromosomes from mom with a little piece of chromosome of the homologous chromosome from dad. Uh, so two, two genes that have never, or two variants, two alleles that have not occurred together in either of my parents can occur, occur together. And we'll look at that a little more closely in just a minute. And then independent assortment of homologous chromosomes. Independent assortment means that when my chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate, chromosome one next to chromosome one. They sort out which one's on the, let's say left and right. Which one's on the left and which one's on the right for chromosome one is random. 
it might be mom's chromosome one on the left. It might be dad's chromosome one on the left and the other one on the right. For chromosome two, that happens randomly as well. It doesn't matter how chromosome one lined up. So for chromosome two, it might be mom's on the left side. It might be dad's on the left side. Similarly for chromosome three. So I could potentially have all of the chromosomes that I received from my father lining up on the left and all from my mother on the right. And then in the gametes, they would have all the same traits from what would be the grandparent of the next generation. Um, but each of the each of the chromosomes lines up independently on that metaphase plate of all the others. So we usually get a mix, we always get a mix and a match of where what traits we're going to get. So for crossing over, we're going to exchange genetic, genetic material between our non-sister chromatids. This is during meiosis one, during synapsis. Um, a nucleoprotein lattice. So this is a framework. It's called the synaptonemal, synaptonemal complex. I don't know where that appears between the homologs. Holds the homologs together while their DNA swaps places. And then they separate out and that material's divided um, differently among chromosomes now. This is what that looks like. So here are my homologous pairs. Here's my homolog number one from mom, number one from dad. We call this a bivalent, bi because there's one, two, set of the two. This is sometimes also called a, called a tetrad because I have four chromatids. So tetrad means four. Um, bivalent is I've got two of each one of these pairs uh, or homologous pairs. So these letters represent the gene. I have the same letter for the same gene, but whether or not I have an uppercase or a lowercase, this is telling me I have a different variant. So here I have uh, A for arched eyebrows from mom or a lowercase a for straight eyebrows from dad, for example. Um, and then let's say down here, this capital D is for dimples from mom, lowercase is no dimples from dad. Same trait in each space, different alleles, different variants. At crossing over, similar sections, so the same length of non-sister chromatids swap place. So when we come over here, we see, oh, wait a minute. These sister chromatids, these would be connected, right? So this would be my little X. These would be connected. But this piece swapped out with this non-homologous pair here. I now have new combinations that I'd never had before. I had, well, I used A and D, but it's C that's swapping out here. Before, I only had all the dominant alleles on chromosome one from mom. Now I have, ooh, a recessive allele. And here I have a dominant allele with these recessive alleles from dads. I have new combinations. Um, let's say this is for arched eyebrows and this is for dimples. If I had only mom's chromosomes in the offspring, then I would always have arched eyebrows and dimples or straight eyebrows and no dimples. Right. So mom had arched eyebrows and dimples, dad had straight eyebrows and no dimples, so I would never have straight eyebrows with dimples or arched eyebrows without dimples. Now I do. So crossing over gives me these new combinations of traits that I didn't have, uh, that weren't possible in the offspring before. So that's crossing over. The other way this meiosis contributes to genetic variation is through independent assortment of the homologous chromosomes. So when they pair up on the metaphase plate, it's completely random. Um, each of the homologs can be oriented toward either pole. And this causes a random mixing 
of blocks of alleles. So we think about this, the possible chromosome orientations for a cell with three pairs of homologous chromosomes is two to the three or eight combinations of how those chromosomes can line up um, along the metaphase plate. So let's look at that. We can have combination one, all of dad's chromosomes, one through three, line up to the left and all of mom's line up to the right. right? So they're gonna be separated out so the daughter has either all of dad's chromosomes or all of mom's. These really would be, let's say this is me undergoing oogenesis or meiosis. Um, these would be from my father, so my offspring would either have all of grandpa's chromosomes or all of grandma's. Here, I might line up with two from dad on this side and the third pair, mom is on the left. So I've just switched this pair here. I'm gonna get different combinations in of, of chromosomes in those gametes. Maybe I switch this pair instead here to here. It's just that one change. Now I'm gonna have an even different set of chromosomes in the gamete. Or maybe I only switch this one. I have a completely different set of chromosomes in the gamete. Maybe I switch these two, yet another set of different distinct chromosomes in the gametes. Or I just switch these two, completely set of different, a completely different set of chromosomes in the gamete. Um, or I switch these two from here, completely different set. Or I do the exact opposite of this. And all of moms go into these daughters that are gonna go to the left and all of dads to the right. Eight different possible combinations Right. So each one of these is going to produce distinct and different daughter cells carrying different combinations of chromosomes that could possibly end up being uh, the gamete that is fertilized. So at fertilization, I have the male and fe female gametes come together. That's another source of genetic variation. But prior to that, so chromosomes donated by the parents are combined. In humans, this should be two to the 23, got the typo here, two to the 23 possible different zygotes because I've got 23 pairs of, um, pairs of homologous chromosomes that can line up independently during independent assortment on the metaphase plate. So this is two to the 23, right? 70, 100, 000, 70 billion. Uh, and then times two, because I have the two different gametes coming together. That's without crossing over. If we only have one chromosome cross over and switch out some material, we have this many, lots of zeros, I don't know, gajillions, four gajillion, genetically different zygotes. Crossing over can occur lots of different times on each chromosome. So we can have loads and loads of different variants coming out in the offspring, in the, or in the, in the offspring once those gametes um, you reunite at fertilization. So Meiosis increases genetic variation through crossing over and independent assortment. And then we increase that variation by fusing the distinct different gametes produced by dad and the distinct different gametes produced by mom to create an individual. That means the likelihood of having exactly identical genes to any sibling is slim unless you're an identical monozygotic twin, meaning we had a fertilized egg, one fertilized egg, and during mitosis, as those divided, they did not stay together. They separated into two individuals and continued undergoing mitosis. So they started as the same individual fertilized zygote, um, and then that split at some point. So identical twins or monozygotic twins 
come from the same. Dizygotic twins are two separate eggs were fertilized by two separate firm, uh, sperm. So other than sharing a birthday, dizygotic twins or fraternal twins are no more similar than um, any other set of siblings. So the significance of genetic variation again, if we have identical clones, we don't have variation. Any change in the environment that adversely affects one individual affects all. So sexual reproduction, we have all those different combinations, 23 pairs of chromosomes. This is two to the 23, that type it was carried over. <sighs> Can't stand it, have to fix that. Two to the 23. Uh, and where else did we see that? Two to the 23. All right, and I will load the corrected PowerPoint. Um, so asexual reproduction is advantageous if our environment is stable and is going to remain stable. It is never going to change. Then asexual reproduction clones are best suited to the environment. They are surviving. They're doing great. And so they do fine then. But if the environment changes, genetic variability from sexual reproduction can be advantageous because some offspring, some of the variants will have a better chance of survival. And there's an example as temperature rises due to climate change, animals with less fur, reduced body fat um, would not be at their thermal metabolic limits and so would have an advantage because they would be better able to cool. All right, so let's look at step by step the phases of meiosis. These are named similarly to mitosis. So if you see a one or a two after the name, you know you're in meiosis. It's mitosis, we just need prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. Um, meiosis, we need a one or a two after it to know what's going on. So in prophase one, similar to Prophase and mitosis, so the spindle forms, the nuclear envelope breaks down, the nucleolus disappears. We enter, each chromosome is duplicated in the S phase prior to prophase one. So we're coming in with identical sister chromatids attached. Um, the homologous pairs line up and kind of wrap around each other in synapsis and could undergo um, crossing over. Our synapsed homologs, when they're side by side, twisted around each other, you can call them the bivalent, bi for two, two homologs, or the tetrad. Each of those two homologs has its exact duplicate sister chromatid, so we have four chromatids total. In metaphase one, those homologous pairs get pushed and pulled to their lined up side by side on the metaphase plate. The bivalence, so my two homologs, my homologous pairs are lined at the spindle independently of one another. That's independent assortment. So whether number one came from mom or dad, doesn't matter, can line up on either the right or left side. If number two came from mom or dad, doesn't matter, lines up randomly. Meiosis one continuing to anaphase, the homologous chromosomes from each bivalent separate. So each of the homologs is still attached to its sister chromatid. They do not separate, but chromosome one is pulled apart from its corresponding homologous chromosome one, and they move toward opposite poles. Um, this reduces the chromosome number in each of the new forming nuclei from 2n to n because I don't have the pairs. I have single chromosomes, but they are duplicated. And then telophase one, each daughter cell has one duplicated chromosome from each of the homologous pairs. And the nuclear envelope reforms around those two daughter nuclei, cytokinesis occurs dividing into two haploid daughter cells, each with sister chromatids. I stop, I do a timeout, interkinesis. Those haploid daughter cells, just take a minute. It's similar to interphase, but it's usually shorter. We don't go through the S phase, but we do some growth. We gather resources, we get energy, we get what we need to go through the second round of meiosis.
Oh, we have a little quick timeout between meiosis one and meiosis two here, talking about parthenogenesis. It's a form of reproduction in which only one parent, usually this is the mother, contributes genetic information to the next generation. So the individuals arise from unfertilized eggs. Um, this was alluded to in Jurassic Park. The whiptail lizard is an example of this. It uses a variation in this process. This also is known to happen in birds. Uh, in the whiptail lizard, crossing over occurs during meiosis between the sister chromatids instead of non-sister chromatids. Um, and that's a normal process of sexual reproduction. So my sister chromatids separate. So if I have sister chromatids of a haploid, they double. Um, we separate those out. The species doubles, doubles the number of chromosomes prior to meiosis, forming a pair of, homolog of homologous pairs from the single parent. So one parent um, during the S phase, we make a copy of those and then we separate those out. Because of slight differences in the sister chromatids, um, we get some genetic variation. Right? So the non-sister chromatids Crossing over occurs during meiosis. Yep. That should be mitosis. Sorry. Well, we have lots of typos in here. Anyway, they take their normal number of chromosomes. They duplicate them. They separate those. They duplicate those. And then they divide those. So we only have a single parent contributing. But in the S phase, um, we're going to double the number of chromosomes. That's going to be what we enter meiosis with after we double that again. So it's going to kind of go through that S phase twice. Uh, meiosis two, we're moving on. In meiosis two, we have our haploid cells. We enter with two haploid cells from the end of meiosis one. In prophase two, just like in mitosis, chromosomes condense, the nuclear envelope disappears, the spindle fiber forms, we connect each of our uh, sister chromatids at the kinetochore, we line them up during metaphase at the metaphase plate, we align all of the chromosomes, we only have N, so 23, we no longer have pairs, so we line them up, we're attached to the kinetochore, uh, and we separate out these sister chromatids from each other. That centromere holding them together dissolves and we pull the sister chromatids apart just like mitosis. So meiosis two is exactly like mitosis. Uh, and then telophase two and cytokinesis. Telophase two, each set of haploid chromosomes gets a nuclear envelope around it. Cytokinesis divides the cytoplasm and organelles. And we get gametes, four haploid gametes each with a mixture of maternal and paternal chromosomes. So here's meiosis one. I have two N equals four. Here's one homolog of this, the two long, blue and red, and the two short. So two homologous pairs, um, four chromosomes. Before entering meiosis, we've gone through the S phase and duplicated these. In prophase one, we undergo synapsis where the homologous pairs wrap around each other and combine, and we see crossing over occurred. They changed bits of genetic information. In metaphase, the, hom the homologs, the homologous pairs line up side by side, number one by number one, number two by number two. Anaphase one, we divide the homologs. So I end up with two chromosomes in each of the daughter cells, so n equals two. These are now haploid, but each of the chromosomes still has its Xerox copy. Now it's not quite a Xerox for those chromosomes, so for those sister chromatids that had crossing over though. So we already have some variation. These two daughter cells take a time out here in interkinesis before entering meiosis two. In meiosis two, I have the nuclear envelope, envelope dissolving, the spindle fiber forming, centrosomes moving to opposite poles, spindles connecting uh, to each of the sister chromatids and pushing and pulling each of the chromosomes into line on the metaphase plate. Anaphase two, we pull those sisters apart. 
telophase two, we get new nuclear envelopes forming. Cytokinesis begins with the cleavage furrow. And at the end of the process, I have one, two, three, four daughter cells, each with two chromosomes, haploid, half the number I started with, and all different mixes. Here I have chromosome two from dad, chromosome one from mom. Here I have chromosome two from dad, but with a little piece of chromosome two from mom because of crossing over. Chromosome one from mom with a little piece of chromosome one from dad from crossing over. Here I have chromosome two from mom, chromosome one from dad, but there's that little piece of mom's chromosome one from crossing over. And here I have chromosome one from dad, chromosome two from mom with a little piece of dad's due to crossing over. So all of these are unique and distinct from the other one, contributing um, to lots of possible variants in the new offspring when we have fertilization, depending on which one of these gametes is gonna be the winner at fertilization. And here we go through meiosis one again. Start with four daughter cells, synapse at the beginning of prophase. We have crossing over because of that synapsis, resulting in mixes and matches. We divide the homologous pairs, reducing our number of chromosomes by half to the haploid number. And then we go through meiosis two. Very similar to mitosis, everything that happens, because in mitosis, we start with duplicated chromosomes and we end with the exact same number of unduplicated chromosomes. We start with two chromosomes, each with an exact copy. It's Xerox sister chromatid. We separate those out in the daughter cells. So if we compare meiosis and mitosis, Meiosis has two rounds of nuclear division. Mitosis, we just have one round of nuclear division. Chromosomes synapse and cross over. The homologs come together and switch pieces. We never have crossing over. The homologs have nothing to do with each other in mitosis. So if you see any reference to pairs or homologous pairs, we're over here in meiosis, not mitosis. Here, the centromeres survive anaphase. That's because our sister chromatids stay connected through meiosis one. Centromeres dissolve in anaphase in mitosis because mitosis separates sister chromatids. Meiosis one halves the number of daughter chromosomes. So for the rest of the process through mitosis two, um, we have N rather than two N. Here, the number of chromosomes is preserved. We make a copy of Xerox so that we can share the information between two daughter cells, share the exact information between two daughter cells. Here, in telophase, I end up with two daughter nuclei. Mitosis is nuclear division. So once I have two daughter nuclei with two N chromosomes, mitosis is done, and then I go into cytokinesis to divide into two cells. My two daughter cells are genetically identical to the parent cell and to each other. And this is used for asexual reproduction in single-celled organisms, uh, like bacteria and in some protists, and for growth, either growth in population size for single-celled organisms or growth into a multicellular organism like us for multicellular individuals. Here I end up with daughter cells, each one of my four haploid daughter cells is different and unique from the parent. This is only used for sexual reproduction. It is not sexual reproduction. It's used to prepare us by producing the gametes that we use in sexual reproduction. So don't make the mistake of saying that meiosis is, for sexual, reprodu is sexual reproduction. It prepares us for sexual reproduction. So the similarities between the two are they both are an orderly set of steps that are involved in sorting and dividing chromosomes. The stages, same name, prophase, 
metaphase, anaphase, telophase. We didn't include anaphase here. Boy, all kinds of errors in this one. Huh? All right. Uh, the spindle fibers play an active role in sorting the chromosome. Um, and cytokinesis follows the end of nuclear division in both of these to divide the cytoplasm between daughter cells. So this table 10.1, um, it's a good comparison of meiosis one to mitosis. And this really lets us see that mitosis two is the, or the meiosis two is the more similar process to mitosis because in all of meiosis one, we're talking about homologous pairs. We never deal with the pairs. We only deal with the duplicated sister chromatids in mitosis. There's no pairing of homologs in mitosis, but there is in meiosis. We never have bivalence. We never have homologous pairs lined up side by side in um, mitosis, but we do in metaphase one. Here, every single one of the duplicated chromosomes lines up. So every one of the 46 chromosomes with its sister chromatid are lined up. Anaphase separates the homologs, anaphase one in meiosis, anaphase in mitosis separates the sister chromatids. At the end of meiosis one, we have two haploid daughter cells, not identical to the parent. Whereas at the end of telophase in mitosis, we have two diploid daughter nuclei within the cell that are identical to the parent nuclei. When we compare meiosis two, we say, oh, look, I don't pair my homologs because I no longer have homologs in meiosis. I separated homologs in meiosis one and mitosis, I never pair homologs. I have a haploid number, but my duplicated chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate. Here I have the diploid number, but it's the duplicated chromosomes that line up at the metaphase plate. In meiosis two, sister chromatids separate in anaphase of mitosis, sister chromatids separate. And in telophase two, I end up with two haploid daughter cells that are not genetically identical to the parents. Telophase, I have two diploid daughters. But unduplicated chromosomes, unduplicated chromosomes, the end of telophase for each of these. Uh, and then this goes through the process and shows mitosis, Here's the big difference of mitosis and meiosis one. Every one of my chromosomes with its duplicate sister chromatid line up at metaphase. Never in mitosis do I have side by side at metaphase. So metaphase one, hom the homologs lining up. This is our big difference. Meiosis one separates my homologous pairs, giving me a haploid cell. Meiosis two separates my sister chromatids, continuing with haploid but unduplicated chromosomes. All right, so if we look at the life cycle um, of living organisms, uh, of those that produce gametes, uh, life cycle is all the reproductive events that occur from one generation to the next. So in plants, we have haploid multicellular individuals. Um, in a lot of plants, we'll get this alternation of a haploid individual adult with a diploid multicellular individual. So we have these alternations of generations. A lot of fungus do that as well. Uh, the haploid individual is called the gametophyte. In some organisms, the gametophyte is the larger, more dominant organism. In some plants, in others, it's the smaller one. So just because it produces gametes doesn't mean it's always the smaller organism. Uh, so in a lot of plants, the one that produces the gametes, so in plants what produces the pollen um, or the egg is the gametophyte. The diploid individual is called the sporophyte. So some examples, mosses are haploid for most of their life cycle. Um, so they are the gametophyte for most of their life cycle. In fungus and most al algae, it's only the zygote that's diploid. And after that, um, they divide into haploid organisms. Ferns and higher plants are typically diploid for most of their life cycles. 
Um, but in plants and algae and fungus, gametes are produced by the haploid individuals. So the haploid individual, we've already got half the number of chromosomes, produces the gametes, and then those two gametes will come together to form a diploid. So in animals, so plants do all kind of weird stuff. In animals, individuals are always diploid. The gametes are haploid. So the only haploid part of the life cycle is gametes. So if ever you see N and we're talking about animals, you know that's a gamete. Half the number of chromosomes can't become an individual. We have to have fertilization. Meiosis only occurs during gametogenesis. So either the production of sperm, spermatogenesis, um, or oogenesis, the production of eggs in females. In spermatogenesis, the end result uh, of germ cells of testes undergoing meiosis is that all four of the cells become sperm. So all the cells in the testes are undergoing meiosis, producing lots and lots of sperm, and that can go on um, from puberty through the entire life, the rest of the adult life of the male. Females, we are way more complicated. In oogenesis, we don't divide the cytoplasm equally between the daughter cells. In each round, one of the nuclei receives more of the cytoplasm. Remember the organelles are in the cytoplasm. We're not going to divide that equally between daughter cells. One is going to get the majority of it. Uh, and then in round two, we're going to get the majority of it. Those smaller, um, the smaller daughter cells are called polar bodies. They just wither away. They're just a way to dispose of any of the chromosomes we're not going to use, right? So that's how we undergo meiosis to divide the chromosomes in half because our gamete needs half the chromosomes. What do we do with the rest of that chromosome? The rest of the chromosomes, we, we toss them as polar bodies. They just wither away or reabsorbed. Um, the one that gets most of the cytoplasm, the organelles, the larger ones, so the largest uh, cell in the human body is the egg smallest is the sperm because the sperm its whole job is to carry just the DNA just the chromosomes from the male from the father to the egg for fertilization everything else that you start out with your first mitochondria your first uh, endoplasmic reticulum ribosomes everything else all come from this egg so we're going to divide unequally to make sure that that initial fertilized cell has everything it needs and that all comes from mom. So in human life cycle, sperm and egg are produced by meiosis. They fuse at fertilization, which results in a 2N zygote. That's our one-celled stage. And then we undergo mitosis to become a multicellular individual. So our multicellular embryo, um, gradually takes on features that are determined during zygotic formation. So initially, mitosis just produces stem cells, undifferentiated. Each one has all the DNA, can be everything and anything uh, when it grows up. As the zygote forms, as we get more, more and more cells and we get some orientation of those cells in the developing zygote, we'll start to get differentiation of what those cells are going to be when they grow up. All growth for our um, bodies occurs as mitotic division. As a result of mitosis, every one of our cells in the body has the same number of chromosomes as the zygote, as that initial fertilized 2N, and has the same genetic makeup. It's that differentiation during embryonic development that lets different cells function differently. Uh, we turn off as our cells figure out what they're going to be when they grow up based on their orientation in that developing zygote. They turn off the genes that they aren't going to need um, or they inactivate those and that's called differentiation. Whereas the stem cells haven't differentiated so any of those cells can become any type of cell. And I talked to that about that a little bit more in the lecture video on mitosis. So spermatogenesis and oogenesis, spermatogenesis, uh, the testes 
contain stem, cell, stem cells called spermatogonia. These make the primary spermatocytes. These are the cells that undergo spermatogenesis. They undergo meiosis one. And those two daughter cells are called secondary spermatocytes. And then those undergo meiosis two to form spermatids. Those are basically the, um, the basis, the cell that is going to then have a tail and a little mitochondria to power that flagella um, and a cap that's filled with enzymes so that it can penetrate, can depolarize and penetrate the egg, um, the acrosome. All those will be attached once we've completed meiosis two, and then we can differentiate to form sperm. In females, oogenesis, the ovaries, the stem cells they contain are called oogonia. These produce the primary oocyte. The primary oocytes are the cells that are going to begin oogenesis, but only a few of these are going to continue through the process of meiosis um, at sexual maturity in females. So meiosis one of this primary oocyte forms the secondary oocyte in a polar body. So meiosis one, we're gonna start, uh, the primary oocyte is gonna undergo meiosis one. At the end of that, I have two cells, a secondary oocyte and a polar body. This is pretty much the DNA divided, my cell divided unequally. The smaller, the one that got less cytoplasm is the polar body, it will just break down, be reabsorbed by the body. The secondary oocyte is the larger one. And it's going to start to undergo meiosis two. It's going to get to metaphase two and stop there. And at this point, it leaves the ovary and enters the uterine tube. This happens at puberty each month prior to the menstrual cycle at ovulation. This development of the primary oocyte and meiosis one occurs during fetal development. So we get part way, we stop, and then we undergo meiosis two and release that egg um, into the uterine tubes each month. If there are no sperm present, that secondary oocyte just degenerates, withered away, up it goes. If there are sperm present, it triggers the secondary um, oocyte to complete meiosis two, forms another, o polar body, because we're going to divide that, um, do that second round of meiosis, meiosis two, separate the sister chromatids and throw out half of that DNA because no possibility of fertilization. When we have an uneven division of cytoplasm again, but we never go through this. So females will never complete meiosis two with the egg unless there's sperm present um, in the uterine tubes. Otherwise, that egg, which has not completely uh, completed meiosis, just is released um, with menstruation and eliminated. So again, all individuals are 2N from fertilization on our zygote. We've got N chromosomes from dad's sperm and chromosomes from mom's egg gives us two N, we can develop into individuals. Only the ovaries and testes undergo meiosis to produce eggs and sperm. So in the testes, spermatogenesis, we start with a two N cell, we undergo meiosis one, we get haploid secondary spermatocytes, we undergo meiosis two, uh, we get our, our spermatids that get a flagella, they get a mitochondria here to power that flagella. They get an acrosome, a cap loaded with enzymes so that they can depolarize and enter the egg. Oogenesis starts with meiosis one. We get this unequal division. So our two daughter nuclei, we divide everything really unequally and we're gonna get rid of that first polar body. If a sperm is present, depolarizes, um, 
the egg and penetrates, then we're going to go undergo meiosis two. Look, these are going to divide. We're going to get rid of that second polar body. Uh, and we end up with an N egg that the sperm can enter and fuse with the nucleus and give us our zygote, our 2N zygote after fertilization. All right, so that's meiosis. What if we have some errors in meiosis and end up with the wrong number of chromosomes? Um, this is something that occasionally happens. It almost always proceeds normally. If it doesn't and fertilization occurs, then early on in mitosis at one of those cell, um, cell cycle checkpoints, it's gonna say, hey, wait a minute, that's not right. And the cell will probably undergo apoptosis. Some combinations though, don't trigger that apoptosis. Uh, sometimes that doesn't happen. We don't catch the mistakes. So when we have the right number of chromosomes after meiosis, we call that euploidy uh, or after fertiliza fertilization. Euploidy is the correct number of chromosomes in that species. For us, that's 46. And euploidy, so u is true, true, the correct number, diploid, haploid. And euploidy is not the correct number, some change in the number of chromosomes. Those karyotypes, that picture we saw earlier of the chromosomes, um, genetic counseling, looks at that to look for aneuploidies, for errors in the number of chromosomes. Sometimes it's a change in the chromosomes because a chromosome breaks or it breaks off of one chromosome and gets added onto the other, so it has the wrong size or the wrong number of chromosomes. Aneuploidy, the wrong number of chromosomes, results from non-disjunction. That's failure of chromosomes to separate, either during meiosis one or two. So either the homologous pairs don't separate properly or the sister chromatids don't. And that can result in a gain or a loss of chromosomes, depending on which of the daughter cells from meiosis is fertilized. So monosomy is when I only have one of a particular type of chromosome. So I only have chromosome one from mom, but not from dad. That would be monosomy. Trisomy is when I have three of a particular type of chromosome. This is probably one that you are familiar with because trisomy 21 is one of the few errors in um, my autosomes, my chromosomes number one through 22 that I can survive into adulthood with. So trisomy 21, I have three copies of chromosome number 21 due to non-disjunction. So either a homologous pair didn't separate in meiosis one or a sister chromatid didn't separate in meiosis two, leaving two chromosome 21s in one of the gametes. So at fertilization, one chromosome 21 from the other gamete comes in and I get three of chromosome 21. That is also commonly referred to as Down syndrome. So I can have non-disjunction occur uh, in meiosis one, where when I divide my hom homologous pairs should separate out, but I don't. And then in the daughter cells that are resulting, I have no chromosome of that number. Remember there would be in humans 40, 23 pairs. So this is just one pair. The other 22 pair would have the right number. Um, but one of these daughter cells that's going to go into meiosis two has two copies of this. So normally in meiosis one, I separate out my homologs. So here I've already got an error. Uh, and then if these cells underwent meiosis two, I would end up with one of each sister in these two, one of each sister. So four with a single chromosome of this number. Here, this would end up with no chromosomes from this gamete for this number chromosome. But here, I would still divide out my sister chromatids, so I would have two of this chromosome in the gamete if it came from the second round of this cell dividing. So here's what that would look like. 
because I would separate out the sisters, but I have two of it, so I'd still have two. Here I'd have none. And again, this is just to show the non-disjoining pair, but I would still have, in a human, 22 other pairs that divided normally. Uh, if I get non-disjunction in meiosis 2, I could have regular separation in meiosis 1. Well, then I have the correct um, cells entering meiosis 2. Here, we divided the sister chromatids normally. If I get non-disjunction in the second round, oh, this gamete has two of this chromosome, while this one would have none of that specific chromosome. Here's an example of if it was non-disjunction um, with just a pair of homologous chromosomes. If this was happening uh, in a female cell with the X chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes. So normally I would divide meiosis one, each daughter gets an X, and then divide each daughter separates from the sister chromatid. Oh, but in meiosis 2, I have this non-disjunction here. Um, so I end up with two of that chromosome, two X's here, but no X's here. At fertilization, if this is the egg that's fertilized, normal. If this is the egg that's fertilized, an X and a Y, an X and a Y. Here, I would have two X's and a Y. Here, I would have no X's and a Y. Over here, if I had non-disjunction in meiosis 1 and ended up with these daughter cells at fertilization, I'd have two X's and a Y, two X's and a Y, and here I would not have no X's and a Y. So if we look at this here, I would have 2N plus 1. So I have aneuploidy, not the correct number of chromosomes. Here I have 2N minus 1. So aneuploidy, not the correct number of chromosomes. This could happen for any of the chromosomes, numbers 1, 2 through 23. If it happens in X and Y, and I have at least two chromosomes in position 23, an X and a Y, uh, or an X, as long as I have an X in position 23, uh, I can survive and de develop into a regular human. Without an X chromosome with only the Y, I'm missing a lot of information. That would be non-viable. Um, that would result in spontaneous abortion. Um, but if I had two X's and a Y or two Y's and an X, um, it's survivable. And we'll talk about those. For any of the other 23 pairs, this could happen. There are only five of those if this happens at five different chromosomes, uh, that it would be viable that after fertilization, the cell would start to undergo mitosis and would not spontaneously abort. So at any of the other 17 sets of chromosomes uh, at mitosis, that would spontaneously abort because uh, it would be a fatal, a fatal error. That individual would not be able to develop normally. Of the five that are viable, four of those result in um, fetal development to a point resulting in spontaneous abortion or to a viable infant that cannot survive beyond infancy, except for two cases, 17, where individuals can survive to about five years of age on average, um, or trisomy 21, where they can survive into adulthood and, uh, and reproduce. So trisomy occurs when an individual has three of a particular type of chromosome. Uh, in hu humans, uh, three autosomal trisomies are viable beyond birth. Oh, I thought two, 21 and 17. Apparently there's one other. The most common is trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. The chances of a woman having a child with Down syndrome increase with her age. It has traditionally been thought that the age of males does not contribute to this or that males don't contribute to this, but actually it turns out that um, there's a greater chance of non-disjunction also in older males. So older fathers can also contribute to 
uh, trisomy 21 through non-disjunction in the sperm, uh, in spermatogenesis. And then Down syndrome has a particular set of characteristics associated with it, short stature, an eyelid fold, uh, flatter facial features, shorter fingers, and a wide gap between the first and second toes, as well as a lot of physical um, ailments, circulatory and heart ailments, respiratory ailments that uh, go along with the errors from having that third, that third chromosome 21. The karyotype for this would be identified by having that third chromosome 21. In this case, it is a male. We have an X chromosome at 23 and a shorter, non-identical 23rd homologous, non-homologous pair because of the Y. This can also happen for the X and Y chromosome, and these are, um, many of these are, are viable and people do live to adulthood are able to reproduce um, with just some uh, some developmental and uh, some physical effects because of this. So changes in sex chromosome number come from inheriting too many or too few X or Y chromosomes. Uh, and these are more tolerated so we can survive to adulthood. Non-disjunction either during egg development, oogenesis or sperm um, development, spermatogenesis. Turner syndrome occurs when uh, the fertilized egg has a single X chromosome. That could have come either from mom or dad. And no second X chromosome. So that could be that dad had non-disjunction and didn't give an X, or mom had non-disjunction and that X came from dad. A single X chromosome. Uh, and the physical features associated with this typically are short with a broad chest, widely spaced nipples, typically normal intelligence, um, but difficult time uh, with reproduction, either delayed onset of puberty, um, typically need hormone therapy uh, in, in order to reproduce, um, to be viable, to enter puberty. Uh, but otherwise can function and behave a normal, a normal adult. Uh, Kleinfelter syndrome is if I get two X's and a Y. So I have two X's. Um, typically in females, we have two X chromosomes anyway, and one of those becomes a bar body. We don't use the information on that. So having an extra one causes some interference, but you know, we're used to shutting down one of those X chromosomes and only having a single one functioning. Um, but here we have interference because we also have this Y. If there is a Y chromosome, you are biologically male. So even though you have two X chromosomes, you're biologically male. Uh, these males with Klinefelter syndrome tend to have underdeveloped testes and prostate. Some have breast development, overdevelopment, they have longer arms, legs, and hands. They can have some lowering um, of IQ, some learning disabilities. Uh, if we have, we have two non-disjunctions rejoin, uh, so multiples, uh, then we can definitely have learning disabilities associated with that. So no matter how many X chromosomes are present, if there is a Y, you are bi biologically male. Uh, we have some examples where we have a specific gene that doesn't function in XY females. So lack of testes is the determining factor um, and that, that gene is what plays a determining role in being in male genital development. Being a male, you can have the Y, but you've got a deleted gene and so you are developmentally female. Here is Turner syndrome. We only have a single X chromosome. Here we have Klinefelter male, two X's and a Y. Uh, we have mutagenic agents that can cause changes in chromosome number and structure. Things like radiation, chemicals, organic chemicals like pesticides, a lot of pesticides can cause these problems, and viruses that can cause breaks in our chromosomes. Um, if those don't rejoin, 
then we can have uh, mutations, change in the chromosome, and we can have change in chromosome structures with deletion, the ends of a chromosome broken off, duplication, we get more than one, that can happen because it's broken off of a homologous or sister chromatid and attached onto another, uh, the same chromosome, or translocation where it moves to a non-homologous pair. We can have inversion. If we get two breaks in a chromosome, um, maybe during synapses we get two breaks and rather than switching places with a non-sister homologous chromatid, uh, it flips upside down and inserts itself um, in the reverse order. So we have changes in human number and structure, uh, human syndromes. If we change that number, it can be detected with karyotype or by looking at inheritance patterns in a family. So there are some um, some that are that are common are able to identify some deletion syndromes, Williams syndromes syndrome uh, lose the end of chromosome seven, and that contains the gene for elastin. As you can still function, you don't produce elastin, and the resulting children that inherit this have turned up noses and wide mouths, very small chin and large ears. Translocation syndrome that we can identify that's common is allergial syndrome. It's a translocation between chromosome 2 and 20, and it leads to a congenital heart defect. Chronic myeloid leukemia is a blood cancer, and that's caused by a translocation between chromosomes 22 and chromosome 9. And here's what those might look like. A deletion where we lose in this chromosome, we lose part of the chromosome. A duplication, we've made a copy of this and inserted it here, so we have a longer chromosome. An inversion where we've had two cuts and we flipped that piece. Or a translocation where we have moved a portion of the chromosome to a different location. So these two switched places, they're different chromosomes, not homologs, and those switched places. And these are some examples of what that looks like. And we can have cells that um, look abnormal as well because of changes in the chromosome number. All right. And that is it for meiosis. Um, take some time with this. Go through it slowly. The terminology is important. The amoeba sister videos can be very helpful in counting chromosomes. All right. I should have chapters 11 and 12 posted uh, between today and tomorrow.